from Microbe TV. This is Infectious Disease Puscast, episode 27, recorded on April 26th, 2023. I am Daniel Griffin, and joining me today is Sarah Dong. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Welcome to another Puscast. References, as always, are available in our show notes at microbe.tv, the home of our growing multimedia empire. And I'm super excited to say it is our birthday or anniversary or whichever uh, framework you want to use. But we recorded our first podcast almost exactly this day last year. I I double checked it. It was April 27th. It was April 27th. Wow. That's Uh awesome. Yeah. So people just, you know, let us know. Are you listening? Do you like it? Do you want us to change things? Um, We would love to hear from anyone. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, Well, Puscast is a review of the infectious disease literature for the last two weeks that we found interesting or entertaining. So on to the literature, shall we? All right, we will start with viral. Remember to listen to This Week in Virology clinical updates and This Week in Virology deep dives for timely viral-related information. So great recent issue of CID with a supplemental section with lots of articles about diarrhea. Uh, I was wondering if I can say that, but here we go. The article prevalence, clinical severity, and seasonality of adenovirus 40 slash 41, astrovirus, sapovirus, and rotavirus among young children with moderate to severe diarrhea results from the vaccine impact on diarrhea in Africa. The VITA study was published in CID and is a great place for us to start. So here they analyzed stool from children aged 0 to 59 months with moderate to severe diarrhea. Um, And without diarrhea, they had controls in Kenya, Mali, and the Gambia using um, quantitative PCR um, among 4,840 moderate to severe diarrhea, MSD cases. Wow, an acronym there. Proportions attributed to rotavirus, adenovirus 40 slash 41, astrovirus, and sapovirus were 12.6%, 2.7%, 2.9%, and 1.9% respectively. So this seems consistent with the assertion that rotavirus is the most significant um, enteric pathogen associated with severe diarrheal disease in young children, uh, contributing to over 200,000 deaths globally. Still a rather extraordinary number. Um, But let us move on to the article, Antibiotic Prescribing Practices for Management of Childhood Diarrhea in Three Sub-Saharan African Countries. Findings from the Vaccine Impact on Diarrhea in Africa VITA study, 20 15 through 2018, um, also published in CID. And here are the results of the prospective case control study, May 2015 through July 2018, among children presenting for care with MSD, moderate to severe diarrhea. We we hear that they defined inappropriate antibiotic use as prescription or use of antibiotics when not indicated by WHO guidelines. They enrolled 4,840 cases among those with no apparent indication for antibiotic treatment for the WHO guidelines. 77.3% were prescribed antibiotics. Oh, my. Um, I finish off here with a bit of good news. Let me just recover from that last sentence. (laughs) The article, Drivers of Decline in Diarrhea Mortality Between GEMS and VITA Studies. Um, Those those four-letter acronyms, FLAs, are the Global Enteric Multicenter Study, that's GEMS, the Vaccine Impact on Diarrhea in Africa, that's VITA, for those paying attention. Um, Here we read that diarrhea mortality among children under five in our African sites uh, decreased by 65.3%. The largest declines in diarrhea mortality between the study periods were attributable to reduction in childhood wasting, an increased rotavirus vaccine coverage, zinc for diarrhea treatment, and oral rehydration salts. Um, All right. Yeah. 
Uh, well, I really like this next one. This paper is from CID, Breastfeeding Among People with HIV in North America, a multi-site study. So this was a retrospective multi-site study from eight sites in the U.S. and three sites in Canada of individuals with HIV who breastfed from 2014 to 2022, which included 72 cases. And so the most common reasons for choosing to breastfeed were health benefits for the child, a family or community expectation. So um, as many may know, there is some concern about disclosing your HIV status, uh, particularly for patients who may have lived in communities where not breastfeeding was really a proxy for um, knowing that someone had HIV and the accompanying stigma that comes with that. Um, and then the last reason for parent and child bonding. In these cases, the median duration of breastfeeding was 24 weeks. They had no neonatal transmissions among the 94% of infants for whom results were available um, at the sort of six weeks or more after weaning. Uh, so this is great. It's the largest cohort of people with HIV who breastfed in a high resource setting um, and just shows that there's a lot of variability amongst policies about how we prophylax children, about how we uh, test and discuss this with our patients. I think this is particularly relevant in the setting of the updated DHHS guidance that I think we talked about a couple episodes ago. So definitely check this out. All right. So these are women who have uh, controlled viral loads on medicine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. That is nice because that was a big change from the early days. Mm. This first one here for me and falls into what I found interesting. You know, we have those that were educational and those that are interesting. Um, well, maybe this is educational as well. The article, <laughs> Wearable Sensor-Based Detection of Influenza in Pre-Symptomatic and Asymptomatic Individuals, published in JID. Right? So here's this idea. I'm going to wear this device on my arm and it's going to let me know if I'm a about to get sick. So here, the authors did an influenza challenge experiment, all right, where they challenged 20 adults with the flu, it was H3N2. Um, I probably have to look through how much did they pay them. Um, the introduction is great where they talk about the research in this area with these smart watches and other wearables. Here, the subjects were monitored with Bidium Pharos 180 devices and had flu squirted up their noses. They were able to detect 94% of the infections on average 23 hours before the symptom onset with the Bidium Pharos 180 device. All right. I see that uh, Sarah's going to sign up for the next time we do this. <laughs> All yeah, right. what if I was just already wearing it? <laughs> just happen to have that on. This is great, though. This way you can, like, ahead of time, be like, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to be sick I'm for work. Am I going to have the flu tomorrow? Yeah, I'm going to have the, I just, uh, my, my watch, it's telling me. <laughs> have someone come in and sub for me. It's I'm 94% cool. certain. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know what's going to happen, I hate to tell you, Sarah, is our, our our bosses in the future will be monitoring this stuff and they'll, uh, when we call in sick, they're like, I did not see this coming. <laughs> All right. Bacterial. Be sure to listen to This Week in Microbiology. Um, in a practical sense, I want to suggest that the article, this article, Emergence of Erythromycin Resistant Invasive Group A Streptococcus, West Virginia, USA, published in Emergency infectious disease is a great reminder that our choices and level of detail in getting that history really matters. Um, I will suggest with some degree of optimism that most of our listeners are aware of the significant number of cases of invasive group A strep where we're now seeing. Um, so what is routinely done? A patient comes in, you make the diagnosis, then way too often they suggest to you that they have a penicillin allergy. If they are seeing me, I explore and in most cases clarify that this is not anaphylaxis and in most cases not even accurate. In too many cases, this is not explored and the patient is given a Z pack. Well, what harm can there be there? Well, Streptococcus pyogenes, also known as Group A, Strept, GAS, um, is a ubiquitous pathogen that produces an array of human disease, including focal infections, pharyngitis, 
uh, that'd be that strep throat, pyoderma with or without localized supportive complications, invasive soft tissue infections, seeing a bit of those lately, myositis, necrotizing fasciitis, and systematic, often fatal infections, bacteremia, toxic shock syndrome. So in addition, we can also get post-infectious complications, glomerulonephritis, rheumatic heart disease, um, all though group A strep, and I will reinforce here, all group A strep remains susceptible to penicillin. Group A strep resistance to other classes of antimicrobial drugs has been increasingly reported. Wait, so if I give a Z pack, I might send out my patient on ineffective therapy? Here we see that the active bacterial core surveillance system, the ABCs system, uh, estimates substantial increases in the proportion of invasive group A strept isolates resistant to erythromycin and clindamycin. Overall resistance rates climbed from less than 10 in 2010 to near 25% by 2017. It's going to get worse. West Virginia, USA has seen um, a notable increase in annual rates of invasive group A strep uh, macrolide erythromycin resistance. At West Virginia University Medical Center, hospitals in Morgantown, rates increased from 37% in 2019 to 54% in 2020, and by 2021, up to 87%. So yes, the next time you take a sloppy history and give out that z pack, bad things might just happen, and it would be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my article I have next is from JAMA, Pipercillin Tazobactam compared with Cefoxitin as antimicrobial prophylaxis for pancreaticoduodenectomy, a randomized clinical trial. So does the use of perioperative broad-spectrum antibiotics reduce post-op surgical site infection after what I am now going to say Whipple because it is easier to say? <laughs> um, this was a pragmatic, open-label, registry-linked, randomized controlled trial, including 778 participants from North America. They found that 30-day post-operative surgical site infection was statistically significantly reduced with broad-spectrum piptazo versus the standard care option of cefoxetin. So 19.8% versus 32.8%. Um, just for a glimpse into dosing, the piptazo group got 3.375 or 4 grams as prophylaxis, and the control group got cefoxetin 2 grams. Um, in addition to the lower percentage of surgical site infections, the patients treated with Piptazo had lower rates of post-op sepsis, so 4 versus a little under 8%, uh, less clinically relevant post-op pancreatic fistula, 12.7 versus 19%. And then less C. diff, 0.3 versus 3.5%. Um, and so the trial was actually terminated at an interim analysis. Uh, they didn't really have a difference in the groups at the 30-day mortality. So I think a very noteworthy trial that potentially we would hope impacts the very high post-op morbidity that we see after Whipple. Um, but I think that if you're diving into this, you're doing it for Journal Club, it's worth the conversation about some of the questions. Uh, I think for me, one I was considering is, is Cefoxetin the best comparator? Um, there were a lot of excluded patients if you dig into it. And I guess the other impression I take away from this is that that is a very high surgical site infection rate. And I think even higher than they were anticipating. Um, so, but I think, uh, Hopefully, as a, I think the way they were able to gather the data and try to answer the question is is probably one of the strengths that's kind of cool about this paper. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, it's interesting. I still see surgeons um, jump to fosox cefoxetin um, mm -hmm. for these abdominal issues. And there's this whole idea, oh, cefoxetin, I, I learned, you know, some mnemonic. There's an O that means it covers anaerobes. Um, it, it does not cover those belly anaerobes, by the way. Yeah. Um, and so it's really not a great drug. And uh, yeah, I'm just hoping that somehow this, uh, this information gets from the journal um, somehow into practice. I'm not sure how that happens in the world of surgery, but okay. 
Okay, <laughs> the article, VE303, a defined bacterial consortium for prevention of recurrent um, C. diff infection. See, I went right to the C. diff and not trying to pronounce those big long <laughs> words anymore. A randomized clinical trial was published in JAMA. Um, so this is what is referred to as a preliminary communication. And I am looking forward to more communications on this issue. But here the investigators took a defined orally administered bacterial consortium of eight strains of commensal clostridia, they call this VE303, and gave this to adults at high risk for um, C. diff infection recurrence in the context of a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled dose ranging study. Um, and so the folks could either get a high dose um, or they could get a low dose or they could get those uh, placebo capsules um, and they get this once daily for 14 days. And what happens. So the C. diff infection recurrence rates through week eight were 13.8% for the high dose, 37% for low dose, and 45.5% for placebo. Ouch. So I looked a little bit more into this and, and where, where did the name uh, VE come from? It's Vedanta Biosciences. Uh, um, and they have a, actually a bunch of these bacterial consortiums or cocktails that they're studying for a, uh, a number of different uh, purposes, infectious, inflammatory, and either some, even some oncological challenges. Oh, cool. Um, I have a paper from the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. Uh, this is entitled Geographic Patterns of Antimicrobial Susceptibilities for Bacteroides Species Worldwide. Results from the Antimicrobial Testing Leadership and Surveillance, or ATLAS, program. That's like a four-star I like that one, <laughs> 2007 <laughs> to 2020. Uh, this took a look at, as you can tell from the title, susceptibilities of almost 5,000 Bacteroides species isolates that were recovered from patients from 12 countries. But it, I think they were basically all European. It was like 99% um, over this 14-year period. The samples were mostly from, I think not too surprisingly, gastrointestinal or skin and musculoskeletal sources. Uh, they did find that the proportion of Bacteroides fragilis was declining, and then the Bacteroides non-fragilis species were increasing. They found that over 90% were susceptible to Piptazo, Mirapenem, and Tigacycline, and there was a significantly lower susceptibility rate to Cefoxitin, Clindamycin, um, Piptazo, and Tigacycline, specifically for the non-fragilis Bacteroides species. Um, so just a little insight. I feel like there aren't too many of these types of studies, and this is quite large, so people could save this for the next time they run into bacteroides on service. All right. And you're right. Geographic patterns and then ATLAS is the acronym. Oh, All right. It's good. <laughs> okay. All right. The article, Intravenous to Oral Antibiotic Switch Therapy Among Patients Hospitalized with Community Acquired Pneumonia was recently published in CID. And here are the results of a retrospective cohort study of adults admitted with CAP, community acquired pneumonia, and initially treated with intravenous antibiotics at 642 U.S. hospitals from 2010 to 2015. Uh, switching was defined as discontinuation of IV and initiation of oral antibiotics without interrupting therapy. Patients switched by hospital day three were considered early switchers. They compared length of stay, in-hospital 14-day mortality, late deterioration, ICU transfer, and hospital costs between the early switchers and others, controlling for hospital characteristics, patient demographics, comorbidities, initial treatment, and predicted mortality. Um, now, that is interesting. As this is a retrospective study, there's potentially an important difference we're not picking up on that impacted which patients were switched early. So, of three 178,041 community-acquired pneumonia patients, uh, 21,784, 6% were switched early. Patients were most frequently switched to fluoroquinolones. Patients switched early had fewer days on IV antibiotics. I hate when they say that. Of course, those who got less IV antibiotics got less days of IV antibiotics. Okay. Shorter duration of inpatient antibiotic treatment. Ah! <laughs> Who saw that coming? Shorter length of stay and lower hospitalization cost. 
there were no significant differences in 14-day in-hospital mortality or late ICU admission between early switchers and others. Then, as suggested before, patients at higher predicted risk of mortality were less likely to be switched. Uh, but then what is interesting, even in hospitals with relatively high switch rates, they say less than 15%, of very low-risk patients were switched early. So I'm not really sure what to make of this. I think that this is an arena that requires a prospective randomized control study. I'm actually and you're not going to be able to blind anyone. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised that uh, that percentage of people who were switched early was quite as low as it was. Maybe it's, that's I think optimistic it's right, I think it's right at the three. Like if you've done day, like it's pretty common, I think, for three days yeah. of IV, which is probably plenty of treatment anyway, and you're probably yeah. done. And then maybe switching on day four, that's probably, um, so yeah. yeah, there may have even been a slight issue with the study design. Yeah. Uh, so this next paper I have, I am going to pick on stool PCRs a little bit again. <laughs> uh, the clinical impact of syndromic molecular point of care testing for gastrointestinal pathogens in adults hospitalized with suspected gastroenteritis, gastro POC, uh, pragmatic open label randomized control trial. This was published in Lancet Infectious Diseases. It was an open label RCT enrolling adults with suspected gastro in a UK hospital. And then they were randomized one to one to either get one of these syndromic stool panels or just routine clinical care, which served as the control. And they used the film array GI panel, which I'm not going to read all the pathogens. It has 22 pathogens um, on it. Their actual primary outcome was looking at the duration of time that patients required single occupancy rooms uh, assessed on a modified intention to treat basis. And uh, I think what we what they found is that there were improved time to results and reduced time in single occupancy isolation rooms, which was the focus. They were saying, um, particularly in the setting of having some limited isolation rooms, but the use of the panel was associated with increased antibiotic use. So 65% in the panel group versus 47% in the control, uh, which in this study, it seems like people were treating Campylobacter um, and not necessarily the C. diff, which I think that was the last episode that we talked about that um, paper. And I think <laughs> if I haven't said it before, I really don't like these stool PCR panels. Um, I think this is kind of a, a little bit of a bummer. I, their intention with the study was looking at the isolation standpoint, so like sort of a separate issue, but um, sort of seeing the the reflex to treat on the PCR panels um, worries me because I think it is very challenging for people to avoid offering antibiotics when you see something that says positive. Um, so... End of yeah, my and partic spiel. particularly the EPEC, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm being silly, but uh, you know, you you wouldn't just like dole out the chemo without calling the oncologist. And I feel like in a hospital when there's ID docs right there wandering around, um, you know, it wouldn't take much to uh, allow us to lend our expertise <laughs> and potentially, uh, yeah, end up with some better outcomes. Yeah. Well, I have also our one fungal paper. I pulled this one from Mycoses, treatment of pulmonary mucormycosis with adjunctive nebulized amphotericin B muconab trial. I like that, that one. I'm trying to decide <laughs> if it's like three versus four stars. Uh, results of, the, of an open label RCT. So this was a parallel group RCT that enrolled subjects with proven or probable pulmonary mucor. They randomly allocated them one-to-one -to, -one to receive liposomal uh, amphotericin B as a control arm or liposomal amphotericin B with adjunctive nebulized ambisome. So the dosing for the systemic ambisome was three to five mg per kg. 32 patients, uh, but sadly it found no improvement in the overall response rate at six weeks and in 90 days survival uh, with or without the adjunctive uh, amphotericin B. They did find that most patients were able to tolerate it. They had some minor adverse effects, but not to the point where they stopped it. Um, so you could argue that maybe we don't know how to dose how much is in the nebulized one, but Overall, the study doesn't really support that it makes a big difference or helps. Um, yep. 
All right. <laughs> so I was just thinking that maybe it's because uh, The Last of Us, the season came to an end and now nobody, everyone's sad. All the fungal people are sad. They're not writing any papers there. Maybe I, I'm going to predict that when the next season comes out, we see a surge of fungal papers, but all right, we'll see. <laughs> all right. Parasitic, be sure to listen to This Week in Parasitism, um, particularly this most recent episode where I did not know and I guessed it, and I will tell our listeners I may have gotten it wrong. So, all right. So remember that great supplement section of CID that I started off with when I got all excited about article after article about diarrhea, it just kept flowing. The article, Giardia, pun intended, Giardia detection and co-detection with other enteric pathogens in young children in the vaccine impact on diarrhea in Africa, VITA, case control study, 2015 through 2018, um, published in that same CID supplemental section. Um, and I thought this was really interesting because just when we thought we had a handle on this little flagellate, maybe I thought I had a handle on this little flagellate, the investigators tested for Giardia and other enteric pathogens using um, ELISA, enzyme-linked immunoabsorbent assays, and real-time PCR on stool. Um, so check this out. Among 11,000 39 enrolled children, GR detection was more common among controls, 35%, than in folks with diarrhea, 28%. So Campylobacter coli jejuni detection was associated with Giardia in controls in the Gambia. Um, among controls, the odds of astrovirus and cryptosporidium species detection were higher. Remember, controls among children with Giardia. Among cases, the odds of rotavirus detection were lower in children with Giardia in Mali. So where is Occam when you want to ask him some questions? <laughs> All right. I will jump to the next article. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if we'll be able to get these photos in our show notes, but go to this article, Feasibility of Training Community Health Workers to Use Smartphone Attached Microscopy for Point-of-Care Visualization of Soil Transmitted Helmets in the Peruvian Amazon published in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. In this study, a total of 45 community health workers who work within the health systems of Loreto, Peru, attended a one-day training session with lectures and practicums on the use of smartphone-attached microscopy and identification of soil-transmitted helmets. The study demonstrated that community health workers show a high level of willingness and competency to learn about both about soil transmitted helmets and smartphone attached microscopy. And they have these great photos. We could actually see this, this little device with a microscope slide stand and and the, the smartphone is hooked in. And That's fortunately really cool. I think <laughs> this is only Android compatible. So I won't be able to use this being a devout <laughs> iPhone Apple person. Um, and then they actually initially I was confused but I was like, oh, okay. So they've got um, these different pictures of different, um, well, parasites or, or eggs, ova. Um, and then they have which ones are which. I'm like, that's not right. And I was, oh, no, it's A goes to A and B goes to B. And so it, it is sort of matching there. But uh, I encourage folks to take a look. Yeah, that's really cool. I really want this little mini, mini microscope. It's One really day, cool, it'll just right? be in our pocket. <laughs> Um, and then I have our final paper. This is just in our miscellaneous section. The article, The Compassionate Use of Bacteriophage for Failed Persistent Infections During the First Five Years of the Israeli Phage Therapy Center, IPTC. Uh, this is published in OFID. In 2018, the Israeli Phage Therapy Center, IPTC, was established as a shared initiative of the Hadassah. I may be mispronouncing that medical center and the Hebrew Hadassah. University. I think oh, Hadassah. Am I getting Hadassah? that right? Don't worry. Now I can mispronounce it too. <laughs> um, and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem aiming to conduct all steps required for a phage-based solution. So from phage isolation to uh, figuring out the treatments um, and addressing it specifically with the patients and whatever non-resolving infection they have. So they are the leading and really only center, it sounds like, in Israel focused on phage therapy. And so they just give a little bit of insight into the types of requirements requests that they received. So they had 159 requests uh, sent to the center. 
145 were from within Israel. Bone and respiratory infections were the most common request, and they have so far had 20 phage therapy courses provided to 18 patients, with 78% having a favorable clinical outcome of some kind of remission or recovery. And so they have a, a table that outlines the different infections they've had that's been mostly focused on Pseudomonas, Staph aureus, and Acinetobacter. So a really cool view into their workflow and, and progress. So hopefully more to come. Yeah. I would say there was a recent editorial, which I did not read because it seemed like it was going to be pessimistic. And it was, you know, has the, has the time for phage therapy, you know, come and gone. And, you know, it's, I, yeah. Anyway. No. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a strong no from Sarah. If there's anything I'm thinking as we head towards the antimicrobial resistance apocalypse, oh uh, we're going to need some more tools to uh, to pull out. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of this podcast. As always, the references for this show are available at microbe.tv, the home of our multimedia empire. You can find the Infectious Disease Puscast at Apple Podcasts, not Android, microbe.tv forward slash Puscast. We'd love to get your questions, comments, paper suggestions, so send them to Puscast at microbe.tv. Remember, it's a great way to plug your paper and get it out there for discussion. If you like what we do, please support the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute or go to Parasites Without Borders at parasiteswithoutborders.com and click on the donate button. I'm Sarah Dong. You can find me on Twitter at swindong at febrilepodcast or at febrilepodcast.com. I'm Daniel Griffin, and you can find me at parasiteswithoutborders.com on Twitter at Daniel Griffin MD as well as on the other podcast this week in parasitism and this week in virology clinical updates. And as always, thank you for this most interesting consultation and allowing us to participate in the care of this most difficult and challenging case. We shall continue to follow along with you. Thank you and dictation and goodbye. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Another podcast is infectious. Infectious.